I'm here with old friends, the CIS. Thank you very much, Greg Lindsay and um, Jennifer, for giving us the opportunity to speak here this evening. Um, I'm reminded by James Boswell's Life of Johnson that he felt that the great man felt uh, people, he said, people feel mean about themselves for never having been a soldier. And I've always had this sense of feeling mean about myself for never having been a teacher. <laughs> because it is such a noble profession. And I'm extremely humbled when I see educators uh, uh, like we've had tonight and on the video talk about this glorious business of what I think is society's most pressing and important calling. Um, on this night, I have to remember the late Professor Helen Hughes. I spent a year in 2012 uh, in the trenches of um, cancer treatment. I was uh, kind of out of, out of action for 12 months in this dormitory dark suburb of uh, amazing great privilege, actually, Sunshine Beach. But it was all dark and the whales were whistling off the coast and the wind was pounding the beach. And uh, I was reading uh, papers from Mark and Helen Hughes about education. And these were my drawings from <laughs> that, uh, that dark period when I was starting to think about what we were going to do to expand the cause of direct and explicit instruction. I was under the hammer from the Sydney Morning Herald, 12 months out of circulation, but they were determined to uh, paint Saint Noel as um, <laughs> the devil incarnate. <laughs> Notwithstanding my withdrawal from public life, um, uh, by no choice of my own. Um, this is a hard business and this is not a exactly popular cause. Um, I said last night in Brisbane that it's now uh, 60 years since Rudolf Fleisch wrote a famous book called Why Johnny Can't Read in the United States. The solution to education, and particularly the teaching of reading, but not just the read, not just reading mathematics, the, the, the teaching generally uh, was apparent to us over 60 years ago, and yet we still have ongoing uh, reluctance to embrace um, uh, what Rudolf Fleisch had identified back in 1955 and the work of Siegfried Engelmann on direct instruction since 1964, and of course our own national reading inquiry in 2005 that told us what we need to do um, to get uh, Australian children uh, enjoying perhaps the most basic entitlement, the entitlement to be able to read, not just the most basic, the most powerful entitlement. I said last night also, I'm just constantly, uh, as I get older and the distance between my late father and myself grows, uh, uh, I'm, I'm ever thankful to his um, childhood advice. I don't know where he got it from, maybe from the missionary, maybe from some book. But he told me from, from the earliest childhood that reading makes a full man. It was a quotation from Francis Bacon, and he constantly drilled that into me and my brothers, that reading makes a full man. And that invocation never departed from me and has always sat on my shoulders. It was the best advice he ever gave me. And it's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about um, uh, ensuring that our children get, and Australian children generally get, the advantage of being able to read. I want to make one point about uh, 
how do we improve Australian schools and the performance of Australian classrooms and make the point that there's a lot of talk about teacher quality. And, and I think what's lost in the debate about teacher quality is teaching quality. We can, in fact, lift Australian schools without a massive change in the noun. We can lift Australian schools if we get the verb going. And, in fact, the noun will follow the verb. If we get the pedagogy right, if we get the teaching right, the teacher will develop. And that has been the story of our own academy. There need be no magical transformation in the quality of teachers. We need to focus on the importance of pedagogy and teaching. We will get the largest return and the quickest return once we understand that we've got to get the teaching right. And the inventor of direct instructions, Siegfried Engelmann, developed in the very early days an operating principle of direct instruction when he said, if the student has not learned, the teacher has not taught. And you think about that phrase. It is the ultimate accountability. We can talk all we like about school accountability and the accountability of educators and education systems. But Engelman's starting point was that if the student has not learned, the teacher has not taught. And uh, there's a further point that I want to make about the about direct instruction is, and 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 this is often uh, n not at all well understood in relation to to the direct instruction program. This is the big DI program. Is that at the micro level, what you of pedagogical practice, it can look, it can seem as if um, there's a lot of practice, a lot of repetition, a lot of embedding and memorization and embedding in long-term memory. But when you take the zoom lens out and you look at the program in the macro, there is in fact a sophisticated instructional design. And this is not a program about rote learning everything. The instructional design actually is all about exposing children to examples getting them to learn the logical rules and make the deductions and inferences and then extrapolating them to new examples, generalising those rules. So one of, the, one of the misconceptions when you observe a direct instruction classroom in progress, when you're looking at the micro or pedagogical practice, you lose the overall picture that as the lessons proceed throughout the program, a very sophisticated instructional design is at work where children are being exposed to examples and then they're able to generalise to completely novel examples. At its most basic, you learn the rule, rule blue, blue smoke, blue car, blue pen, blue cup, blue water, and all of a sudden the novel alien comes through the door. Blue alien. And of course, the program in its, in its latter years starts to get extremely sophisticated. All of the pieces start to come together and children are able to logically discern higher order patterns. So at first blush, it might seem like a rote learning program. There's a lot of practice and returning to the, the material that's been taught in previous lessons. But in the macro design of the instructional programs, um, this is, this is a, a very sophisticated and extremely well-designed um, program that is about equipping children 
with the logical rules so that they can eventually discern very complex patterns and generalize from the rules that they've learned. I want to say something about higher expectations. And I'm in a, a very combative uh, <laughs> discourse with my colleague, Dr. Chris Sara, in relation to this whole question of direct instruction. I think he knows very little about. I don't know that he's ever been in a classroom where direct instruction has ever been taught. But I'm in furious agreement with his call for higher expectations in Indigenous education in particular. Furious agreement, complete alignment. There's been too many decades of low expectations. And if Sarah has done anything, it has been to underscore the critical importance of holding high expectations for disadvantaged kids and Indigenous kids in particular. Where I part ways with Chris is that it is one thing to have high expectations of a student, but it is the teacher's duty to furnish that student with the means to meet those expectations. It, to my mind, it is completely cruel to have high expectations of a child and then not give them the means to meet those expectations. If you don't give them the means to read successfully and to perform mathematics successfully, then you've set up a cruel expectation. You said these Aboriginal kids, you'd be able to perform the same as the kids at Blue Haven or Broad Beach State School, but you haven't furnished them with the means to meet those expectations. And meeting those expectations is a question of pedagogy. It is not a question of self-esteem or racial pride. No amount of racial pride and exhortation to that effect will furnish a kid with the means to be able to read. In fact, pride will come when you read successfully. It is achievement and hard work that is the wellspring of pride and esteem. It can't just come simply on the basis of the color of your skin and some self-consciousness about that. This is where I part ways with Chris. Fundamentally, I'm on the same page in relation to the expectations, but you've got to go further than that. You then have a moral duty to give the child the means to meet those expectations, and this is a question of pedagogy. In fact, Siegfried Engelman hammered out those pedagogical principles since 1964, and Barack Rosenshine actually compiled the taxonomy. The actual principles of I do, we do, you do, model, lead, test, were hammered out by Engelman following his commencement in this area in 1964. Finally, I do want to give an opportunity to Phyllis Yunkaporter, my colleague from Cape York Peninsula, who came with me to the United States in 2009 when we were uh, guided by Professor Kevin Weldahl from the Multilit program here in Sydney. We had had very promising success with Multilit, remediating students at Cohen. We had a little tutorial room on the edge of the school. We weren't allowed in the main classroom but at least the department allowed us to run a remedial program on the side of the school in the mid-2000s. And we were so impressed with how the kids were responding to the multi-lit program. The kind of question occurred to us, well, if the teaching in this, in this tut tutorial room is so good, why isn't it happening down in the main classroom? We had a time of it trying to break into that classroom 
It took us a couple of years. And finally, Kevin told us uh, that, the, in fact, the ancestral program of Multilit was direct instruction. So we went to the United States with the support of the Vincent Fairfax Foundation. And we saw direct instruction in African-American classrooms in Atlanta and in uh, Oregon. And uh, we were completely persuaded. Phyllis, myself, and the late mayor of Arakun, and representatives from Cohen, and we said, we're going to bring the program back to, back to Australia. And uh, we, we, just, we put a business case together with the support of the Vincent Fairfax Foundation and uh, put it to the Queensland government. And we finally got our Cape York Aboriginal Australian Academy established. Uh, I think the point has been made by Glenn and Kiriana that we have a full curriculum, not the least of which is our music program. We have a fantastic instrumental music program. Cohen is one of these schools where almost every child is an instrumentalist. <laughs> Saxophone, trombone, you name it. The James Morrison joined with us as a partner. We made sure we recruited a music teacher and that music teacher was put through a crash course to go from knowing two instruments to knowing 10. <laughs> and she then had to teach the kids. And, uh, and Siegfried Engelman was actually the one who said to me when we visited him in Portland, um, uh, actually in Eugene, Oregon, Siegfried said, make sure you have a good music program. So we have a fully rounded curriculum, but we are unapologetic about the foundational importance of our direct instruction program. The, um, the model of school that we've kind of, we, we proposed and that, that we have is, is what we call a partnership school. It is the closest thing to a kind of uh, charter school that we have in Australia. It's not as hardcore as a charter school in the United States, but essentially it's a public school that is not entirely um, the responsibility of uh, the public school system. We have a, a delineation in relation to responsibilities in operating the school. The department's responsibility is to do all of the school operations. They hire all the staff. They are all education department employees and all of the policies and procedures of running a state school apply to our academy. The teachers remain employees of the system and all of the finances for operating the school come under the jurisdiction of the department. Moreover, the facilities continue to belong to the state and are the responsibility of the department. We didn't want to get into the industrial operation of the school, and neither did we want to get into the facilities management of the school. What we were concerned about was our side of the partnership being the curriculum and the pedagogy. That is the part that our Cape York Aboriginal Australian Academy through good to great schools determines. And we determined that direct instruction and explicit direct instruction were the prescribed curricula for our schools. And where the direct instruction program wasn't available off the shelf, we developed our own curriculum materials for our culture and club programs. And those are constantly under development and refinement. That is the nature of the partnership. The department employs the teachers and runs the schools and administers the budget. And we take care of the curriculum and the pedagogy. It seemed to me that this is the optimal model for us to spread school reform without going back to the old story when prior to us being involved, uh, the whole scene abjured any kind of effective instruction in relation to reading, mathematics, anything. 
Cohen had a very high rate of attendance. We had worked with that community through the 2000s. So the, the, the problem of underachievement at Cohen uh, wasn't a result of the children not turning up. The great injustice that was going on was the kids were turning up and they were not being taught. We had to get in there and change the teaching supply. We had strong and developing learning demand but completely unjust teaching supply. And the situation did not change until we changed the governance of the school. The constructivist and whole language approaches were completely entrenched in remote education as they are largely throughout systems across the country. And uh, it, it a strong objective of our academy was to say, well, you know, um, this is not about ideology, this is about the evidence. Fortuitously, John Hattie's Visible Learning came out about the same time that we started the academy. And plainly the evidence was there in favour of direct instruction. And, and so uh, we, we've... We've been very pleased with the journey that we've had at Cohen and Hopevale. Um, but in the, uh, I, I want to acknowledge before I bring Phyllis up here, Phyllis, if you could come up. Um, I want to acknowledge Con Kalos, who was the principal at Arakun last year. And because what has gone on at Arakun is a complete travesty, where the, the actions of the Queensland government have really destroyed five years of work. The actions of the Queensland government have destroyed five years of work, and you know the, the great tragedy. And, and they're, they're not even aware of it. They're, they know not what they have done. And and what Con did um, last year was uh, the data shows that we finally hit our straps in Arakun. Those children were achieving at reading and mathematic rates. They were getting through those DI programs um, at a tremendous, you know, one program per year, which is what we want. We want the children to complete the program within the allotted time. Getting mastery and progress, they're the two wings of the plane. You want to lift the rate, but you've got to keep the wings are on even keel of mastering the material and progressing through the program. And, and Arakun's best year was in 2015 when our lesson progress was, um, uh, was over one lesson, uh, one year's progress in 12 months of schooling. And um, I, we're, we're in a state of real flux about what the future of Arakun is going to be. We've gone a term without the program. Uh, we're still um, in negotiations with the Queensland government about the future of the school there. And all of this because of incidents that took place outside of the school that had to do with law and order and juvenile delinquency and lack of policing. And yet the Queensland government turned it into a question about pedagogy. And we went through three months of hell about direct instruction. And, uh, you know, as I say, they, they know not what they have done in relation to um, the, the, the complete unravelling that's taken place. Um, particularly in relation to the work that um, uh, uh, a succession of principles like Con Kalos um, were, 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 was achieving with um, uh, the kids from that community. I want to let um, Phyllis speak in relation to her um, experience uh, at Oracle. <laughs> Ayang nam pungatra filas yang kapota ngai ak arakun an palwampungan 
my can con ngam pek a kin punchin a kin palan wampin my inan kang kwa ang book money arakun skolan a direct instruction and mayin hello my name is phyllis yankapota i come from arakun i acknowledge traditional owners of this land i stand on I would like to talk about the Arakun school and how, of how the eye was taken from my weak children. It, it certainly was a deprivation of my children at Arakun by the Queensland government taking direct instruction away, I must say that. <clears throat> we had a partnership with Cape York Academy, with Education Queensland. My heart is torn at what has happened. I see my little children. They have been deprived of their education. And in today's age, we really want our Aboriginal children to have an education that can pretty much see them with qualifications and a profession in life. And for the good people like Con Kalos and his wife that have been, done so much for Arakun, and with the Cape York Academy team, with my brother Nawal here, especially putting that in place. And having invited me and the late mayor to go to the states when I was the deputy mayor. We brought direct instruction into the Arakun school. And on implementing it into the Arakun school, we could see changes when we first introduced direct instruction into the classrooms. Because at first, a family member that worked in the school had said to me that same year, in year 2010, that why bring in another program when we already have an uh, education system in place? I didn't say anything. I left it at that because several months later, the same person came to me and said, oh, Sissy, I can see a change in my grandchild who's in grade three. She's now reading a book fluently. So the skepticism people had at the first instant they had to experience for themselves to see the change in their child. My, my community of Arakun, as a weak nation, I follow the footsteps step, of my elders that have been there, you know. I stand up for the community, even though we have our structural leaders in place. They express their views on local government. I want to express my views from the community itself. So I try my best. I want people to listen, like the government, like recently when Anna Pelache, our um, premier, Queensland premier, came to Arakun. I pretty much told her that don't deprive my children of an education, don't close the school. Because what's going to be there for my weak children if, if we're not going to have anything of an education, you know? We want people that come to Arakun to think they can support, to support us properly in taking the notes they sit with, you know, with, with us and take back to their desks in Brisbane, you know, to pass on the proper words we've said, rather than be manipulative of the words they put together 
and tell the world that what they tell is the truth. Because they're not telling the truth. We are. And it's about time, I think you heard it from the grassroots up. The very person, a weak person, that fully knows what goes, in the com goes on in the community, especially in the school. Because right now, what we face in the school is that our children are not learning. They're not concentrated in the classroom lessons that are pretty much given in while direct instruction was there. When direct instruction was there, every child in the classroom had something to look to. They concentrated on the lesson. Everybody was 100% concentrated and engaged with what the teacher taught. And so I say to the Queensland government to bring back the direct instruction pedagogy and the Cape York Academy to be partnership with um, Arakun State School, as it is now called, I, I guess. This is how disappointed I am today, how sad and torn in my heart I am for my weak children. Because if they're not going to have an education today, what's there for the future? It simply means that they've now created more disengaged youth in the near future. We want these weak children to have an education that's proper. And as a weak person, I stand today to tell the truth.